Hello and welcome. What we're going to be looking at in this video is we're going to be looking at the poetry of Kenneth Slessor and just going through some things about not only him, we're also going to go through all of his poems and we're going to uh, just have a quick look at, at uh, Slessor's place is basically in Australian literature and how he fits in as a poet and how he just fits in generally into the whole context of Australian literature. Okay, so to start with, he was born in 1901, died in 1971. He was an Australian poet. Uh, he lived much of his life in Sydney. He was born out in Orange, but he moved to Sydney at a very young age and basically um, lived most of his life, actually just around the corner from where we are, in Chatswood. So he um, wasn't too far away from the city and it was often the subject of his poetry as well. So he really wanted to uh, bring sort of Australia into the modern age, particularly in terms of its literature and, and moving it into the cities where people were starting to live. Uh, he was well known as a poet as a journalist and as a war correspondent. So he wasn't just a poet, he had a number of other uh, strings to his bow, so to speak. He certainly had a, a much wider career apart from poetry. In fact, poetry was a small part of his career. He was mainly known as a journalist and uh, he was involved in a number of different publications and also served as a correspondent in Africa and in um, uh, New Guinea in World War II as well. And work represents uh, modernity as well as life and death. So. He, he tries, as I said before, to bring Australia into the modern age, and certainly in terms of its literature and, and in terms of the subject matter of its literature, to get it away from the bush, and we'll go through that a little bit more later. Um, but also life and death. So he covers some of the things that uh, a lot of the ideas that a lot of the classic poets covered as well, and particularly this idea of life and death is one that's covered in quite an uh, interesting and quite a unique sense, and particularly Slessor preferred to use a, a very uh, nautical kind of... Uh, uh, metaphor and particularly use the, the sea and the ocean a lot to uh, symbolize life and death. So there are a number of different aspects to his work and certainly uh, it makes him quite an interesting poet and certainly if you look at him compared to someone like um, Henry Lawson or Banjo Patterson or even other Australian poets, uh, you see him as being someone who is a lot deeper and a lot more varied in terms of his subject matter, uh, certainly one who's more respectful reflective of Australian modern age. He was a very progressive thinker and he certainly um, carried a lot of values which we see now particularly in a, a multicultural and cosmopolitan society as we are. Okay, so let's look at him just firstly in the context of Australian literature and just very quickly where he fits in. So uh, unlike many of his uh, predecessors, he focused on Sydney rather than the bush and he really wanted to move away from the, uh, the idea of the bush. Firstly, because it had already been well and truly done. And I mean, Lawson and Patterson were both the authorities on the bush. They, they owned it. So to move it into Sydney was also to bring it into a sort of a modern cosmopolitan age. As I said before, uh, people were starting to move away from the bush. And even in the sort of the 20s and 30s when um, these poems were being written, it was sort of split evenly between the bush and the city. He still wanted to represent um, Sydney in the, in the and I guess in the sense of where it's going, as in people are one day going to be living in the cities and not so much living in the bush. So he wanted to really represent that. Um, he wanted to, as I said, it is more attuned to our modern view. And certainly if we look at, at, at poetry in a modern context, we still very, find it very hard to associate with the values of Lawson's and Patterson's poetry, but yet Celeste's actually does stand the test of time a little bit better. Certainly there are a lot of references in his poetry which has, has since become sort of outdated and Particularly, if you look at the sort of imagery, it, it does take a little bit to picture it. But at the same time, it also is a lot more, as I said, attuned to the way that we think and certainly the way we think in cities. And uh, it also really looks at the, the, the city of Sydney in terms of its, its deeper meaning and certainly uh, in terms of the various things that we think about. We don't just think about representing Australia as, oh, well, we've got wonderful bushland. It thinks of presenting us as a modern progressive group of people who are uh, willing to change these old traditions. He was a nihilist. It was, he moved away from the, the traditional values and particularly those of, um, of our, I guess, our ancestors, the ones who had come across from England and had all these traditions sort of ingrained in them. He wanted to move away from that and really represent something that was more modern, progressive, and essentially, it was one of the, I guess, one of the really first outspoken people about trying to move us away from, I guess, the, the dumb convict image, which we often get associated with. And as I said, he despised things like censorship, for instance. He, he certainly um, uh, 
even though he was uh, an Anglican, he was quite against, I guess, uh, he, he was very much for the sort of the, the secularization of uh, church and state and to sort of keep these things separate. And certainly he was heavily involved in Australian po- uh, publishing, sorry, for that reason, because he wanted to really uh, not only pre- uh, show his progressive side, but also because he really did despise censorship and he really did value this sort of freedom of ideas and freedom of expression. And was very much sort of in favour of things like sexuality um, and also in terms of just be- basically people having the, the will to say what they pleased. Uh, was very much something that he really did um, fancy quite a lot. Okay, what we're going to go through now is we're going to go through uh, some of his poems. We're going to start with Out of Time, which is basically uh, a poem about really a narrator looking out at the sea. Now, in many of Slessor's poems, you would see him quite visibly represented, but in this case, we've still got to look at him as the persona because even though these poems are pretty much written with him in as a centerpiece. Uh, there are aspects of him which probably don't uh, necessarily match up with him as a character, and certainly if you think of it this way, you need to look at him as either the poet or the persona in these poems. So we'll look at him that way. Um, and he's looking out at the sea, which is basically serving as this giant metaphor, uh, or this giant analogy for life and death. And it's split into basically three sections. So first of all, we had the first section, which is basically lamenting the time and the sea for ruining these moments. And sort of, it, 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 it's sort of reminiscent of this idea that uh, basically with the, the tide going out, we sort of, with, with the memories fading as the tide does, we sort of feel that, oh my God, we're, we're losing something important. We're losing uh, special memories. And certainly it ruins these sorts of moments. And as time progresses, as time flows like the sea, it basically just continues on going and, and drags us well and truly past those moments we cherish and basically to the point that it actually ruins them. The second uh, section sort of reinforces this tide uh, image and basically it comes back and he's able to resist this. He, he, he uh, basically sets up this image of standing in the water and going, ha ha, you, can, you can't get me because even though as the tide's going out, I'm standing here and I'm not moving. So it's almost him mocking it to in, to some extent, although he uh, still does sort of recognise the importance of, of time and certainly the flow of it. And the third stanza, he's caught in this tide. The tide wins um, and he is caught up. He's like caught in a rip. So uh, it, it sort of takes that image literally almost to when we look at it and we get that metaphor that even as we resist and even as we mock time and sort of go, okay, well, we can... Um, you know, we can stand in the water and, and even as the waves go out, we can still stand there and you won't get us. But even then, the tide's going to be strong enough and it's going to wear us down to a point where we, we have to give up and we have to submit to it. And we have to basically let it take us out to sea where eventually we do perish and we get that image as well. Now, the poem uses a, a narrative form and certainly a, a strong sense of symbolism to basically represent time. And it uses uh, these nautical and oceanic references, which are, are quite common in his poetry. It ultimately reflects how one can basically not resist time and, and one cannot continue to fight the tide, so to speak. So when we're looking at it, we're looking at it in terms of we get this image of someone who's standing at the sea and, and looking at um, the birds and all the things that sort of surround it. Birds are almost like they're, they're seagulls, they're like vultures, they're scavengers. And... Uh, As he continues to fight the tide, he basically, he gives in, he gives up. And we get that through the symbolism of basically what is occurring in that image that we're given. And particularly as it ends, we sort of get this image of of seagulls sort of uh, picking up sort of corpses out at sea and the idea that basically time has has won, time has has got you. Okay, we'll move on to uh, Five Bells. Now, Five Bells is basically his... um, I guess his centerpiece poem it is his, his most famous one. It was written about uh, the death of a friend of his uh, by the name of Joe Lynch. Now, he was an illustrator who worked on one of the magazines that he worked on. And the funny thing about this poem is usually poems uh, about someone's death are written normally quite soon after the event. Well, this one was written 10 years after he died. And it's not so much a poem about basically an elegy for him but rather something that sort of relates to this memory of him. And 
and these motifs, which are basically similar to how we looked at them in Out of Time, are used to signify this time. So we've got that oceanic nautical reference again. But we also have this reference of five bells, which we'll go into in a minute. But um, basically, this poem is, is not so much about... Um, it is about uh, Lynch, and certainly does uh, feature a strong narrative about sort of moments in his life and, and the, the things that he uh, did and the memories that they shared together. But it also sort of focuses on... Uh, basically this question, and if you read a biography of, of Celeste, he basically asks this question, why am I still thinking of him after all this time? And why do these these bells make me think of him? And that's basically what this poem's about, is the, um, this sort of symbolism of these bells making him think of his friend, uh, who died basically falling off a ferry. Uh, the story of his death's not exactly 100% clear, but... Uh, it seemed he fell overboard while crossing Sydney Harbour, drowned. His body was never found. Uh, and the time he died was around about 10.30, which is where the five bells come into. But we'll get into that in a second. So we get that, that image and we certainly get, um, not only that, we also get this sort of flashback as well. Um, and it uses these flashbacks to basically reflect on Lynch's character while he's still alive. And... Um, and it almost serves as basically points which are stimulated by the hearing of these bells. So as he hears each one, he gets a different flashback to a moment in his life. And, and even moments after his death as well, when um, Slessor goes through his apartment and um, sees all the things that he has lying around. I mean, he was an interesting character and certainly um, a, a significant character in, in his life. And certainly... Uh, a distinctive one, and certainly this is what this poem is quite good at conveying. Um, the bells symbolise two things. They symbolise the ferry, the thing he died um, cr crossing, and basically the five bells signifies 10.30pm. And essentially the way that the, the nautical bell system worked was that they ring every... Uh, uh, well, it, it sort of goes in a cycle of every couple of hours, and five bells basically means 10.30, or the time that he fell overboard. And so it... It basically um, makes him think of him every time he hears the bells in the harbour and he's, sort of, he's sitting there and he's uh, minding his own business, so to speak, and when the bell rings, he starts to think of him again and he sort of wonders why this sort of uh, feeling's ingrained into him and, and why he can't shake it, even after 10 years. I mean, 10 years is a long time and yet he still thinks about him as if, you know, if they were still together. So uh, it's, it's one of those interesting sort of things and even... Then, I mean, he was a friend, he wasn't um, someone like, he, he wasn't married to him, so to speak. So it, it's interesting that he still thinks of him even 10 years later. Um, and as I said, even 10 years later, he's still thinking of him, and it's quite a, a strong sort of, uh, it's a pervasive metaphor. It's one that basically continues not only to symbolise that time, that time frame of how long it is, and even the time where he died, but also basically this idea that... Um, that Lynch is still sort of persisting in his memory. And that's basically it. Okay, moving on to sleep. Now, there are multiple connotations to this poem. It's quite an interesting one because it basically conceptually deals with a number of different ideas and uses a number of different metaphors in a way that they actually sort of join together. And we get things like life, birth, love, sex, uh, lo loss, and sleep. Now, having all these things together, and certainly uh, depending on your viewpoint, I must admit, I, I thought this, when I first read this poem, it immediately jumped as being something about love and sex. But it does also come across as one that is really strongly about birth as well. And this idea of sleep is, is sort of uh, represented in a, in a, it's an abstract idea which is represented by a figurative sense of giving birth. That is that in sleep, you're inside this little cocoon, and then in the morning, you're sort of wrenched out of it like you are when you're born. And we get this very strong imagery at the end of, of basically this um, this child being born, and um, and even the imagery of the forceps, the thing which is used to help um, bring the, the baby out when it's being born. We sort of get this feeling that um, waking up from sleep is sort of like being ripped out of this uh, this safe zone, this cocoon, these, all these different things. And so it, it sort of distances sleep from, I guess, the individual who's sleeping and uh, sort of creates this own, uh, this sort of, this little, uh, I guess, little blanket, this little uh, uh, sort of 
extra existence, so to speak, which uh, sleep often gives you. Um, and what these basically these ideas have in common is this idea of abandoning the self, which is basically a person willingly or otherwise losing control of their body. So as I said, it's sort of going into that extra dimension and abandoning yourself. So it's almost like having an out-of-body experience like you are when you're doing these sorts of things. Um, I mean, I probably couldn't really talk too much about love and sex angle, but certainly in terms of the birth angle, then it is literally an out-of-body experience. You're abandoning this, uh, this basically, this maternal um, life inside the uterus, and basically, um, by being born, you're uh, you're leaving that self, and then being basically born into the real world. Um, and it's rife with imagery. And as I said, it's particularly this final stanza where. The, um, where this, this image of giving birth is sort of presented to us in a very raw and um, sort of strong kind of way. We really get this idea that sleep is something that's being really wrenched out. But also, as I said, this idea of life at, at the beginning where we get this idea of birth and, and also, I mean, the idea of abandoning self comes across in terms of we abandon ourselves when we die, our soul leaves us and all the rest. But in terms of life, we get this very strong image that basically by creating new life, we're basically um, giving a new part of ourselves to different people. And, um, and that's where we get a lot of these different concepts. So certainly when you're looking at this poem, you're going to see a number of different uh, ideas come up conceptually. And really it, it, it creates this very strong image of um, all of these things. And depending on your reading, you can basically associate any of these ideas and make a very strong argument. Okay, moving on. We'll look at five visions of Captain Cook, and basically, uh, this poem is a story of him, and it's a, a, a tribute paid to Captain Cook, obviously. Uh, but basically, it's something that not only captures his idea of Australia, but culminates in his death, and really represents him in an odd sort of way, because he's not just a, a colonizer who comes to Australia. Um, it does make some nods earlier on, particularly in the poem, to other European explorers and, and shows why he's starker, why he's stronger, why he's different. Uh, but also, it's basically something that gives him a divine quality and, and pays tribute to his character. Now, basically what this does is it sort of highlights Cook as being a bit of a progressive. And um, basically, we get this idea, first of all, of very sensory and strong language and imagery being... Um, gradually instilled with this grandiose sort of aura, um, which is Shadow on his death, and we'll get to that in a second, but this, this aura that's created is sort of this idea that um, Cook was a man who was brave, who was courageous, who uh, was almost daring. He, he's sort of given almost like a god-like, father-like quality, as in he is the father of modern Sydney. Now, certainly if we're looking at it in the modern context, and we certainly look at things like... Uh, indigenous perspectives and, and uh, a lot of conflicting views on who discovered Australia and who is the father, I guess, of modern Australia. And we certainly get a lot of uh, different uh, sort of points of view and different viewpoints. But in Celeste's case, we really get this sort of strong um, aura about him where he's, he's considered to be someone who abandons the old ways, abandons what these other European explorers thought that Oh well, it's it's nothing. There's nothing here, and thinks no. This is this is a place where we can live, and uh, and basically this is an aura, this godlike aura, which gets shattered really quite meekly when uh, in the last uh, the last poem or the last collection of five, uh, he is killed, and he's killed by his own weapon, ironically enough. Um, so it's these sorts of things which. Uh, are sort of created and presented, and this progressive, which comes with great risk, ends with great um, sort of, I guess, peril, and certainly is not rewarded ultimately for the things he does when he not only discovers Australia, but also Hawaii and the other places he goes. Uh, but basically, the, there's this sort of idea that he is someone who uh, modern Australians can look up to as being someone who's willing to push the boundaries and willing to go... I'm going to go over here. I'm going to see what's what's coming, what's coming next. Okay, moving on to sensuality. Now, sensuality is, again, another one of these um, modernist, really strange uh, poems, which has this very strong fascination with life and death. And 
it pretty much carries on this very frantic sort of pace. Um, it has this repetition of enjambment structure, first of all, and virtually every line is enjammed onto the next. And it blends a number of devices to, together. And basically, it's trying to give you a, a sensory overload by putting all these sensors together and really cramming them together. I mean, you read this poem quickly. Uh, it sort of overwhelms you with these senses and overwhelms you with the sense of life and overwhelms you with the sense of death and it sort of blends them together. So in terms of a poem which normally if you'll uh, describe death as a sense, then you'll do this and you'll separate it and if you'll do life, you'll do it separately. In Celeste's case, what he's done is he sort of uh, put these images together so uh, almost not only organically but so uh, quickly, the pace of it is so quick that they sort of blend together as one. So we get the sensory overload first of all, but then we also get this idea that life and death are the same. And there's this, essentially this, um, this idea that um, by thinking of beginnings and ends, you sort of thinking of life as being a circular thing which uh, ends in the same place it begins. And certainly a lot of the romantic poets before him uh, sort of had a similar idea, and it's why in, on some occasions he is called a bit of a romanticist. Um, feeling food, feeling fire are sort of repeated as well, um, as are sort of ideas that, um, such as plague and blood in the mouth, represent death. So, and when we get this sort of repetition of feeling food, feeling fire, we get them in terms of the survival instinct, as in we need to feel food, we need to feel fire, and in other words, there are survival instincts. And the plague, the blood, the things which cause death. And basically by merging the two of them together, we see survival as basically a case of not only the things that give us life, but also the things that um, we need to sort of avoid when we're um, trying to avoid death, so to speak. And those two things being, I guess, an idea of survival, which we need our senses to be able to tell us, uh, sort of really merges everything together quite neatly. So we get this very short, sharp, and direct and very quick poem which sort of merges a whole heap of things together. And that's basically what sensuality is. It's one that's quite strong in that way. And you can somewhat think of it like the brain and how it works and how it has all these different signals coming in at once and then it tells us to do all these different things. Okay, moving on, because we've got Elegy in the Botanic Gardens now, and this is actually, it's one of my favorite poems, strangely enough. And the reason for it is it's, it's very odd. Um, it references the study of botany and Latin love and traditions. And basically, it is a very sort of um, confused poem, I guess, is, is one way you could describe it. And the reason for that is it's sort of one that appears romantic at first and then really gets quite nihilistic and quite skeptical by the end. And basically, it shifts from this romantic view of nature and places it with this very skeptical view. As in someone who is once young and in love and, and free and, I guess, sort of sees the world from this very romantic perspective, immediately sort of goes into this nihilistic view of what a botanical gardens is. And that, first of all, it's, it's a very pretty place full of lots of very pretty plants. But then it sort of gets to this... Um, the sceptical attitude that it, it's for school children. It's uh, for school children to be bored to death by basically plants and they walk through the gardens. And it's for botanists and people who have too much time on their hands to, to, to study life, to categorize it, to have these Latin names for things. Uh, this idea of botany, all these sorts of things. Now, Slesser, if you look at him sort of biographically, he was one who really didn't have a lot of time for nature. And you might consider this to be part of his point of view. But in terms of um, how we look at it, we sort of get this argument that we shouldn't be categorizing it, that we shouldn't be uh, uh, sticking to these old traditions of naming everything and, and having these Latin names, that we should be thinking about, um, I guess, new ways of engaging with our landscape. And we get this romantic view which is almost shattered by the fact that we need these traditions, we need to categorise, we need to have these botanical gardens so we can study them and do all the things that we do when we look at plants. It's an argument basically against institutionalisation, I'll get that in a second, um, of nature. It basically uses this Latin imagery of, of Cupid and, and um, plant naming to basically, it's a rebellion against authority and certainly 
these Latin images, if you think of them in perspective, I mean, Latin was the language of the church. It was the language of authority in England. And it's authority which we sort of brought along with us when we started naming things. And so in order to progress, we sort of got to let go of some of these traditions that we have, and particularly this idea of Latin and these, these images of Cupid, things that have been around since the Roman times when the Romans had conquered England. And then as uh, England evolved, we still sort of kept them. And then when the English came to Australia, we still have them. They haven't quite left us yet. So we've got all of these things. And basically, it's almost um, trying to say that we should be mourning this, this or we should be um, saying goodbye to this old ways, this old culture. And, and basically, to um, it sort of it creates this very pessimistic, almost depressing attitude. It's sort of a, a sense of hopelessness that we get. And particularly the um, repetition of the, of the gardens at the end and the, the name of the gardens uh, sort of really re- reinforces that, this very pessimistic and, and as I said, very sceptical view of, of the role of nature and the role of um, what the botanical gardens do. It's basically the poet agonising as well over basically this idea of this lost love. And it is this catalyst for a nihilistic turn. Basically, the moment he stops talking about the lover is the moment he starts talking about these other things. So you could also insinuate that there is an idea of a lost love in there as well. And certainly, it's a very strong catalyst for this turn. All right, final poem we're going to look at, which is Beach Burial. And basically, it's one of his last poems, and it was written as a, as a war correspondent when he was in El Alamein um, during World War II, which is in the north of Africa. And it's basically about him watching sailors from ships that were torpedoed by the Germans uh, floating to shore like driftwood, like tidewood. Um, And then they were buried in the beaches afterwards. So they basically, it was almost a case of dragging the bodies from the beaches and burying them not too far away from them. And it's sort of this very um, interesting kind of poem in, in a number of senses. It uses, first of all, this very calming and yet very horrific image of dead soldiers, com- sailors, sorry, coming to shore. And it's, it's sort of calming in the sense that they seem very peaceful, and yet at the same time we get this image in our head of, well, hang on, they're not, they're not bits of wood, they're bodies. They're, they're people who have basically died, had a r- horrific death drowning at sea, and now, and now are being washed ashore. Um, the sand joining them is basically friend and foe, so not only are the Allies being... Um, being sort of drifting to shore, but also the enemy soldiers as well. And then being buried together, basically this exposed nature of death is not only are they sort of naked, they're, uh, they're quite exposed to the fact that they're not really anything anymore. They're, they're just different um, bodies, and they might as well, um, as much as it might sound horrible, uh, be faceless and nameless, even though they are genuine people. And it's a really horrible sort of horrific image that sort of really communicates quite deeply the nature of war, how all these bodies sort of washed ashore um, hopelessly and helplessly, and um, they've been killed, and certainly in many cases they're almost unidentifiable, and sort of really creates that strong image of, of um, not only horror that we get out of it, but this nature of war. It's also quite unique in that it uses a very structured style. It has a four-line stanza, and it, it seems to have this, these um, various sort of conceits in them, which um, is, is in stark compos- opposition, shall I say, to a lot of his very freeform poetry, which we often see from Slesser. And basically, it, it's considered to be one of the reasons why Slesser gave up poetry at the end of World War II was the fact that uh, he felt it was too structured and he um, found himself sort of... Uh, falling into these habits of in incorporating structure. And we certainly see some of that in this poem, uh, in that we get a very sort of um, sincere structure. And we get a number of different um, uh, sort of impressions from each line and each bit. So we really get a beginning, a middle, and an end to this poem. So it's a narrative, but it's a very structured sort of narrative, which, as I said, is it's quite um, distinct and particularly compared to the rest of his poem. Okay, now let's look at some impressions of Slesser's poetry. And what we're going to look at here is we're going to basically look at uh, a bit about the context of how his poems were published and what it really says about him as a poet. Now, first of all, his poems were published in books mostly, and they were published often on a small scale. And 
apart, uh, a sort of point of difference between him and, and a lot of poets that came before him, particularly in Europe, was as opposed to those poems being sort of shared around sort of uh, different communities and not really focusing so much on, on, on being published, uh, Celeste's poetry was written in the, in the sense that they uh, were sort of almost written for publishing. They were written to be published. They were often published on a small scale, and a lot of his, particularly his earlier poetry, was printed in a very small um, uh, workshop. And they often came with uh, different uh, drawings who, from his, his friend and, and um, companion, Norman Lindsay, who um, was, is a very famous Sydney artist, and he was well known for drawing sort of nudist imagery and, and nudist paintings, which for Victorian England at the time, oh, sorry, Victorian Australia at the time, who we still sort of carried on a lot of our old habits from the old country, uh, was sort of very quite risque. He was quite a controversial artist for that reason, uh, because of the fact that he did paint nudes, and which is something that we sort of had gone away from, particularly after sort of Victorianism came in, and uh, a lot of the, the nudist imagery from um, the earlier sort of eras had been covered up. Um, he went straight out and basically ignored that and said, "I'm going to paint nudes anyway," and uh, is quite famous and basically fits in quite. Um, quite well was Slesser, who was one who opposed uh, censorship and was very much about free expression. And so these two go along quite well, and um, for that reason, Lindsay did also include some of his uh, wood carvings into uh, uh, Slesser's poetry books, and uh, those were in, in his initial poems. Of course, these later poems, the ones we read now, um, and I guess where a lot, a lot of his success was gained was actually after he stopped writing poetry when a lot of these things were, were published in sort of uh, anthologies of his poetry and we started to see some of his, his poems really hit more mainstream circles. Uh, he stopped in 1945 and basically he, uh, he completely abandoned writing poetry after World War II and he basically became involved quite a lot in publishing instead. He did continue working as a journalist but Mainly, he also started really working in publishing and started to uh, uh, take on different projects that sort of bent the rules of censorship and, and certainly even ironically uh, went on the Australian Censorship Board, uh, basically to sort of try and loosen up some of the old conventions on it and start to let some more things through. So it, ironically, he did actually um, become involved in censorship, but it was mainly to sort of uh, perpetuate his views that Australia shouldn't be a nation of, think of censors, that we um, need to start really to be progressive, to move a forward as a, as a country, to be modern as a, a group of people. We need to sort of uh, really move away from these values of, of particularly England, but also these, um, these values of basically censoring things. And so he became quite heavily involved in, in publishing. He also sort of if you look at him biographically, he feels that he, um, he be, his poetry became too structured and he, he lost a knack for it. He basically, after Five Bells, which is one of his last poems, and certainly after Beach Burial, he completely lost the, the ability to be able to write poetry. And for that reason, completely gave it up. So we sort of see poetry sort of being written in his younger years and in his older years, he completely um, left it behind and started working on other things. He is progressive, as I mentioned before. He was an advocate of freedom of speech and expression, and his, his nihilistic views, which do come across quite strongly, um, certainly this anti-authoritarian, certainly, um, if you look at a number of his different poems, uh, does come across quite strongly. He was one who really wanted to push for modern Australia and one who wanted to move away from a lot of the old values, which I guess we still sort of uh, feel from time to time that we sort of get... Um, sucked into the old habits the, of the old country, so to speak. And even now that Australia is quite a progressive society, there's this idea that um, it's because of, of people who wanted to really uh, instill this modern idea of Australia um, that um, we get that, and yet we still are sort of burdened a little bit by this bushland culture and this idea of uh, the man, of, man from Snow River and... Uh, and Henry Lawson's short stories and all these sorts of things which really advocate us as a nation of people who live in the bush, even though if we're looking at this in the modern context, of course, we majority of us live in cities and uh, a lot of us basically value being able to have freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Also, it sort of reflects Sydney, and he had a great love of Sydney. 
And basically, this harbour image, which and he, he does use the sea quite a lot, but because it becomes a great, really great influence on his poetry as well. And certainly, we do see this quite strongly in his work. So, if you look at all of these things together, we sort of get a very strong context of Slesser as one who is a city dweller. He's one who uh, looks at the modern values of what a city brings, and certainly he's quite progressive in that sense. And um, through his work in publishing, he also paved the way for, I guess, a lot of others who sort of thought like him. And certainly we see that that um, mindset in his poetry, but it's one that he continues on with, and certainly we see it with a lot of the more progressive works in Australian culture now. And that's basically about it for his his first of all his poems, but also the context in which he wrote them. So to look at this and look at, at, at I guess, a future direction now of where to uh, go with these sorts of ideas is to, to look at, at his poems again in that sort of light and that he really does sort of feel um, that his poems, are, I guess, have more in common with perhaps a lot of the European poets than the Australian ones. And you still have to look at why that is, and it's probably because of a lot of these different values. Okay, but that's about, about it for Celeste's poetry in context and in summary. And until next time, I'll see you later.